Welcome to the Oxford Lectures on the Philosophy of Mathematics. I'm Joel David Hemkins, and this is the week two lecture on the topic of rigor, by which I mean mathematical rigor in the calculus, the rise of rigor in the calculus. So these lectures are mostly uh, based on my book entitled Lectures on the Philosophy of Mathematics, and it's available from MIT Press, and I'll put a link in the description. Um, so uh, calculus was, of course, in developed independently by Newton and Leibniz, uh, and that was followed by more than a century of raging dispute over the proportion of credit due to each of them. Um, and uh, in a sense, that dispute was harmful for mathematics because, for example, the mathematical historians have sometimes said that British mathematics was hurt by the dispute because uh, British mathematicians would be following Newton's notation and not using the Leibniz notation, which in many respects was superior. So my opinion is that we should accept mathematical ideas and insight from wherever they arise. Okay, so calculus of course is concerned with instantaneous rates of change. And one of the central ideas of calculus is the concept of continuity. Now, in, in natural language, of course, we have different meanings for what it, we make a distinction between having a continuous process, which is a process that proceeds in an unbroken manner without interruption versus a process that proceeds continually, which means that it, it proceeds without end. So for example, you might hope that your salary payments arrive continually in the coming decades, but it's not necessary that they arrive continuously because it's fine to get a payment each month, for example. Um, Okay, but in mathematics, we are mainly concerned with the former uh, unbroken concept. So a continuous front function is one whose graph is unbroken uh, in a sense. So when I was in junior high school, my teachers would say a function is continuous when you can draw it without lifting your pencil. So the idea is that we can draw the function in one uh, sweeping motion without lifting the pencil. And the distinction to be made is for example, if the function has a step discontinuity, then we have to at some point lift our pencil up. Okay, but of course this, uh, this <clears throat> way of speaking is, is mainly metaphor. It's not sufficiently precise to ground a mathematical argument. It's really inadequate. And I would say it's also inaccurate in detail because of course the pencil, it has some finite width and so on. And so it wouldn't be functional. And also the material coming off the pencil lead is, discrete atoms of carbon and so on. And so this is not precise enough. Okay, a slightly better way of talking about continuity in a calculus class one often here is a slightly better statement. A function f is continuous at c if the closer and closer x gets to c, the closer and closer f of x gets to f of c. So this is definitely an improvement because it's talking about the concept of uh, having good approximations of the function from nearby points, but I would say that it's still much too vague and actually it's not quite right. So suppose you're in New York in Central Park and you start at Central Park South walking uptown. Then as you walk through the park, you're getting closer and closer to the North Pole, if only slightly. So the point is that because you're walking north, you're getting closer to the North Pole, but there's no sense in which you're getting close to the North Pole. And so that phrase about as X gets closer and closer to X, then F of X gets closer and closer to F of C, is not giving us enough information about how close x is getting to c and how close f of x is getting to f of c. And so the <clears throat> contemporary definition really solves this problem. Well, let me give another example. Suppose we have a hiker on a, uh, um, on a gently sloped plateau with, which has a cliff. The hiker is walking down the plateau and the closer and closer she gets to the edge, the closer and closer her elevation function gets to the valley floor, right? <clears throat> because the, the plateau is sloped downwards. But we wouldn't say that her elevation function is continuous because of course, once she goes over the edge, then uh, there's a jump discontinuity there. So this closer and closer way isn't really uh, getting the whole story. So the contemporary notion of defining continuity solves that issue. Um, <clears throat> so specifically, we say that a function f is continuous at a point c if for every positive epsilon, no matter how tiny, there's a positive number delta uh, such that if x is within delta of c, then f of x is within epsilon of f of c. So let's draw a picture. 
<clears throat> so here's a function f, and we pick a point c here. And now the claim was that for every epsilon, no matter how tiny, so if I think of this is f of c, then the, the y value of f of c is this horizontal line. And we want to have a, within epsilon of f of c means that you're contained in this horizontal band. So this is plus or minus epsilon. Any y value in this band is within epsilon of c, of f of c. And then, <clears throat> so the claim was, right, for every epsilon, uh, there is a delta. And delta is telling you how close to c you have to be. And so let me draw these uh, plots here. So this is uh, plus or minus delta uh, of c. So for any x within delta of c has its f value within epsilon of f of c. So that's the formal epsilon delta definition of continuity. I could say we could look at this picture and ask, is this delta good enough for that epsilon? And actually, I didn't quite draw it accurately because it's a little bit ambiguous here. So let me draw it a little better. So <clears throat> this line comes up like this and, and the function is leaving the top of this square. And so then the question is, is that delta good enough? And the answer is that it is not good enough. For this particular delta, it wasn't quite good enough to guarantee that if x is within delta of c, then f of x is within delta epsilon of f of c. Because if I take an x right on the outside here, right very near the edge, then the function sort of leaked out the top of this little box. And so that f of x is not actually within this epsilon band. So a better delta would be a little bit smaller. Yeah, I need a slightly smaller delta. <clears throat> Oh my God, my picture's a mess. So let's make a slightly smaller delta like this. Okay, so now the square here, those are the x's within delta of c, and they all, their f of x values are exactly on this red part of the curve, and all of those f of x values are within that epsilon band. And so all of them have the property that f of x is within epsilon of f of c. Okay, so that delta is good enough. And one can write a sort of formal, uh, let's, let's write out the definition. So F is continuous means at every point C, no matter, <clears throat> for, every, for every positive epsilon, no matter how small, there is a delta so that, uh, um, so that for every X, if X is within delta of C, then M of X is within, epsilon of f of c. Okay, so that's the definition we're talking about. This upside down a means for all and the backwards e is a way of indicating there exists. Now let's consider continuity as a kind of game, the continuity game. The continuity game is played between two players. There's the challenger who is skeptical about the continuity of f and there's the defender who's trying to defend uh, the honor of the function f, the continuity of the function f. So the challenger puts up hard instances. Uh, so plays a difficult point C and plays a very tiny epsilon, right? We, we, <clears throat> and then the, the defender has to provide a delta that's gonna work. And then after that delta is played, the challenger um, uh, plays an X, which is within delta of C. And then if it turns out that f of X is within epsilon of f of C, the defender has won the game. And it turns out you can prove that a function is continuous if and only if the defender has a winning strategy in that game. Now, this is a completely general idea, this game idea, because almost every assertion in mathematics can be written uh, in, in a formal language which involves these alternating quantifiers. It's completely standard. Many mathematical statements have these alternating quantifiers and any such statement can always be given the strategic reading, be, the, the game theoretic reading played between two players, namely there's the challenger and the defender. So sometimes people talk about these two players as Abelard and Eloise. So Abelard is playing the universal instances and Eloise is the defender. She's playing the uh, existential statements. So the point is that uh, <clears throat> the statement will end up being true exactly when Eloise has a winning strategy in that game. And my view, we talked about this a little bit last week in the discussion, my view is that uh, <clears throat> 
this game theoretic reading is part of why humans may have a sort of innate capacity for understanding these very complex mathematical assertions because humans evolved uh, in a competitive environment in which this kind of strategic reasoning was important for our survival, uh, uh, we developed a capacity for, for that kind of reasoning. And that kind of reasoning is exactly the mathematical reasoning. So this may be part of the explanation why humans uh, can understand these extremely complicated mathematical statements. So I'd like to illustrate a little bit uh, this epsilon delta definition by giving a little argument, a very common argument in real analysis um, namely, I would like to prove that the sum of two continuous functions is still continuous. So I have one continuous function f, and I have another continuous function g, and I'm looking at the function that you get by adding them together, f of x plus g of x, or f plus g, that function. So I want to argue that it is continuous. So let me erase this. <clears throat> I'm looking at the function f plus g, you know, and in order to argue that this function is continuous, we need to win the continuity game. So someone gives us a point c and gives us a, a positive epsilon, you know, and I need to find a delta so that any x value, when I apply this function to it, I'm going to be, uh, if that x value is within delta of c, then, f of, then, then this function applied to x will be within epsilon of f of c plus g of c. So I want to get close to f of c plus g of c, yeah. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that epsilon and I'm gonna break it in two pieces. I'm gonna use half of my argument uh, with f and half of the error with g such that the combined error will still be less than epsilon. So if epsilon is positive, then epsilon over two is also positive. So therefore we get a delta one because f alone is continuous. We get a delta one so that if x is within delta one of C, then F of X is within epsilon over two of F of C, okay? And similarly, we get a delta two, so that if X is within delta two of C, then G of X is within epsilon over two of G of C, of G of C. Okay, I can get as close as I like. In particular, I can get within epsilon over two, which is more than we had been asked for. But now the point is that uh, if I just let delta be the minimum of delta one and delta two, one of them is smaller, so take the smaller one. And now I think this delta is going to work because if X is within delta of C, then it's both within delta one and within delta two of C because delta was the smaller of them. Uh, so then I claim f of x plus g of x is within epsilon of f of C plus g of C. And the reason is that f of x is within epsilon over two of f of C and g of x is within epsilon over two of g of c, so altogether the error is less than epsilon over two plus epsilon over two, and therefore it's going to be within epsilon of the final uh, uh, target value. So this is why the sum of two continuous functions is continuous. Now this argument, this kind of argument, <clears throat> is extremely common in real analysis. It's called an epsilon over two argument, and it's the kind of argument you get when you take your epsilon and you chop it in two pieces and you make a separate argument for each piece. But there's also epsilon over three arguments, epsilon over five arguments, and so on. In fact, there's even epsilon over two to the n arguments using the fact that epsilon is equal to epsilon over two plus epsilon over four plus epsilon over eight plus epsilon over 16 and so on, an infinite sum. And the point is that when you have a quantity that you want to bound by epsilon and you can break it into infinitely many pieces uh, and make the first piece uh, within epsilon over two and the next piece within epsilon over four and so on, then all together, even after you add up all those pieces, the total error will still be less than epsilon. This, this kind of argument is called estimation. It's, a, it's one of the central tools of real analysis is making estimation arguments. And I want to emphasize that the word estimation here is different maybe than uh, in natural language. In natural language, when you estimate something, you're basically 
maybe guessing what it is, but estimation and real analysis is not about guessing, it's about proving bounds on how big the error can be. And if those bounds are very small, then you know the error is definitely very small. <clears throat> so there's a kind of slogan that I like to mention. The slogan is this, in algebra, it's equal, equal, equal. But in analysis, it's lesser equal, lesser equal, lesser equal. So the point is that when you're doing algebra, maybe you're doing group theory or algebra in some extensions of the rational field or something like that, then you typically have a bunch of equations and you're substituting the parts of equations into others and making more equations and deducing equations and so on. So it's equal, equal, equal because you're dealing always with equations. But in analysis, you're doing estimation arguments. And so what you're doing is you're showing that this quantity can't be any bigger than this, which can't be any bigger than this, which can't be any bigger than this, and so on. So you have lesser equal, lesser equal, lesser equal, less than epsilon at the end. So in analysis, it's lesser equal, lesser equal, lesser equal. Now we also have an epsilon delta account of the limit concept. So let's just say what that is quickly. So we say that the limit of a function f of x as x approaches c is equal to l. What this means is that for every degree of accuracy epsilon, for every positive number epsilon, no matter how small, there's a delta so that if x is within delta of c, then f of x is within epsilon of l. So this epsilon delta account enables us to be extremely precise about what it means to say that the limit of a function is a particular number. But why all this fuss? It seems so complicated and detailed uh, with all these epsilons and deltas. Is it really needed? Can't we get by in calculus with a more natural intuitive account? And the answer to that question is yes, because the history of calculus proceeded for more than a century without the epsilon delta definition. It didn't arrive until, until Weierstrass and Cauchy and Bolzano in the late 19th century. So, Newton and Leibniz were using much softer concepts of continuity and limits and so on. Um, and these sufficed for most of the early development of calculus. Uh, right. So let's uh, talk now about the concept of instantaneous change so that one of the central ideas of calculus is to understand the concept of instantaneous rate of change of a function. So suppose you have a steel ball and you're at the top of a tower and you drop it. <clears throat> so the ball falls, but it doesn't fall at a constant rate. Of course, it speeds up, it accelerates as it falls. Maybe it reaches terminal velocity at some point, but let's think about the part before that. So it's getting faster and faster as it falls. Um, and so the situation is totally different from the case, say, of a train traveling on a track at a constant rate. When you have something moving at a constant rate, then you can use the formula distance equals rate times time. And you can find out what the rate is because you just uh, measure the time elapsed over a certain distance. And then you plug into that formula and you can figure out it was going, you know, 120 miles an hour or two miles an hour or whatever the rate was. But that method won't work for the steel ball falling. So imagine you're midway in the tower looking out the window and the ball is passing and you want to know right at the moment. Uh, when it's in front of you, how fast was it going right at that moment? And so there isn't really any interval that we're talking about. Or if we took a tiny interval of time and, and uh, or, or space and figured out the elapsed time and so on, we wouldn't be getting the instantaneous rate. We would be getting the average rate over that interval, which is not quite the same thing. So how did the early practitioners of calculus solve this issue? Well, they had the concept of infinitesimals. So let's talk about how that goes now. So let's consider, say, the function x squared. So I have the function x squared. It's a parabola. So this is f of x equal x squared. And I have maybe a point. Here's x and f of x. And I want to know what's the instantaneous rate of change of this function. So that is the slope of the tangent. And the, what the early practitioners of calculus, uh, so, the, the, so the instantaneous, in, instantaneous, oh my God, if it's like okay, instantaneous rate of change 
okay, is the slope of the tangent line. So we want to calculate this. It's just the rise, uh, the rise over the run after an infinitesimal change in x. So we're going to change x by an infinitesimal amount and move from x to x plus delta, where delta is an infinitesimal number. So we just calculate then f of x plus delta. That's the new y value minus the old y value. That's how much it went up by. So if I think about how much we went up by. Uh, and the, the run is delta. Now, so rise over run, but we're talking about the function x squared. So I can calculate this exactly. It's x plus delta squared minus x squared over delta. And if I expand this out, what I get x squared plus 2x delta plus delta squared minus x squared all over delta. But notice the x squareds cancel. And so what have I got? 2x delta plus delta squared over delta. And now I can see this delta is canceling in there. And I got 2x plus delta. And now the uh, early practitioners of calculus would say, well, because delta is infinitesimal, it's an infinitesimal number, we can therefore ignore this delta. Now it's infinitely small. And so we can just say 2x. And therefore, the instantaneous rate of change uh, at this point is 2x. That's the slope of the tangent line for the parabola. It's 2x. OK. So did you see what we did there? The crucial step was ignoring this delta here. Okay, but this is also, of course, the problematic step because what are these infinitesimal numbers? I mean, when I say an infinitesimal number, do I just mean an, a really tiny real number? Well, if I mean just a really tiny but positive real number, then I would be wrong to cast it out at this point, because these wouldn't be equal. This one would be slightly bigger than, than this one. But if I mean by infinitesimal that delta is infinitely small, then the whole thing is kind of problematic because, well, look, I'm doing algebra with this delta and so on. What kind of numbers are these infinitesimal numbers and why can I add them and multiply them and so on? And what are the rules? And when I want to, say, be computing the instantaneous rate of change for other more complicated functions like, you know, trigonometric functions and exponential functions and so on, then why can I apply those functions to the infinitesimals at all? It would seem that we would need uh, a complete explanation of the mathematical structure in which those infinitesimals are existing. And so what's going on? Bishop Barclay made a withering criticism of the, this foundational issue in the calculus with infinitesimals. So he said, and what are these same evanescent increments they are neither finite quantities nor quantities infinitely small, nor yet nothing. May we not call them the ghosts of departed quantities? So Barclay's mocking point, right, is that the foundations of calculus um, are extremely problematic. And <clears throat> for example, the same kind of reasoning that we use in, uh, that we just use here, can also be used to generate uh, illegitimate conclusions. For example, you might say, well, 2 delta plus delta is equal to 3 delta. So therefore, 2 delta and 3 delta differ by this vanishingly small amount. But if I say 2, therefore, 2 delta equals 3 delta, and then divide by delta, I'm going to conclude that 2 equals 3. And the kind of reasoning that I just used here is awfully similar to the kind of reasoning that I used over there. Um, but here, we're making this absurd conclusion. And so the foundations may be problematic. I mean, in, in defense, the, the, the early practitioners of calculus were somehow finding a way, they avoided all these kind of problematic uses of their method. And the uses of the method that they did use, for the most part, were completely uh, uh, unproblematic. Um, but the difficulty is understanding exactly where this boundary is and why is it that this one works and that one doesn't work and so on. Okay, so what is the modern definition of a derivative? Let's just say that. So I'm going to erase this calculation here with the infinitesimals. That's the old way of doing it, the modern way, right? The instantaneous rate of change is the limit as h tends to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. So now what I do is Instead of an infinitesimal delta, I'm using a real number, a positive real number, but I'm going to take the limit as that number goes down to zero. And so I'm basically drawing a little triangle in here 
and having the secant line between f of x and f of x plus h. So this again is the rise over the run. And if I calculate this, then uh, you're going to get the, the algebra is just the same as before. It's going to be the limit as h tends to zero of 2x plus h. And this is what's equal to 2x. So therefore, the derivative of x squared is 2x uh, because I'm taking this limit. So the point is that I'm not just using one very small quantity. I'm using essentially increasingly tiny quantities and taking the limit as they approach zero. And that's the contemporary definition. OK, so I'd like to emphasize that uh, this, this epsilon delta understanding, say, of continuity, it's not just making precise the old notion of continuity. That's not all it's doing. It's opening the door to an enlarged vocabulary of concepts. So now, because we have this delta, epsilon delta conception, we can formulate other kinds of principles that can be expressed in a similar way and that maybe we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have arrived at those concepts uh, without having epsilon delta. So for example, let's mention uniform continuity. So a function is said to be on the real, say, is uniformly continuous means for every epsilon, no matter how small, for every positive epsilon, no matter how small, there is a delta, a positive delta, so that whenever x and y are within delta, then f of x and f of y are within epsilon. Okay, let me say it again. For every positive epsilon, there's a positive delta, so that if x and y are within delta, then f of x and f of y are within epsilon. So wait a minute, how is this different from continuity? Because continuity said, let's write them down here, compare them. So uh, continuous means, uh, so F is continuous means that for every point C, for every positive epsilon, there is a delta. So that for every X, if X is within delta of C, then F of X is within epsilon of F of C. Okay, that's what we had before. Now F is uniformly continuous means for every positive epsilon, there is a delta. So that for every X and for every Y, if, uh, if X and Y are within delta, then F of X and F of Y are within epsilon. So this Y is sort of like the C up there. Okay, but what's the difference? In fact, so I wrote this in my book. Um, and the, the copy editor said, did you mean to say the same thing twice? And of course, they're not exactly the same. And maybe to a mathematician, they're obviously not the same because they're starting different and so on. But quite a bit about them uh, is similar. This Y is playing the role of what C does up here. I could change this C to a Y. It would look even more similar. Um, and the difference is that with uniform continuity, this delta can be has to be chosen solely on the basis of epsilon. And it has to work for all the x's and y's. But in continuity, I first fix the point C and then epsilon, and then I get to pick delta. So delta can depend on C. So with continuity, it's slightly weaker requirement because the delta, the defender, can use a different delta depending on where you are on the curve. And so, for example, if you consider the function y equal x squared on the reals, that's certainly a continuous function. But it's not uniformly continuous because the parabola gets, gets as steep as you like if you go out far enough. The slope is 2x, and they can make that as big as you want if you just make x big. And therefore, there can't be a single delta that works uh, for, for a given epsilon. Because for any epsilon, then if you, if you have a candidate delta, then if you go out very far on the parabola so that the function is extremely steep, then you can find x and y that are within delta, but their f values are further than epsilon apart. You can make them as far apart as you want. So therefore, there can't be any delta that works for a given epsilon, precisely because the function becomes too steep. Now, if you're restricting a continuous function to a compact interval, say the unit interval, a closed unit interval, then it's a general fact that uh, every continuous function on a compact domain is uniformly continuous. Okay, so 
Right. <clears throat> so let's let's look at these definitions again. We got we got this one from this one just by essentially rearranging the quantifiers a little bit. And so what I'd like to do now is a little exercise of moving the quantifiers around a little bit more and seeing what kind of statement we get. So consider the following statement. There is a delta so that for every epsilon, um, and then what do I want to say? For every x, for every y, if x and y are within delta, then f of x and f of y are within epsilon. So my question is, what does this statement mean? It seems sort of syntactically similar. All I did was move some quantifiers around. I think I just changed the order of those two quantifiers. And the question is, what does this statement, which mathematical concept does this statement now express? So you can think about that for a little bit, maybe pause the video, um, and then we'll discuss it. So I claim that this property is true for a function on the real numbers, if and only if the function is constant. Okay, so, so let's suppose, of course, if the function is constant, then the property will be true because f of x and f of y will be equal and therefore within epsilon. So we'll get that this implication is always true if the f is constant. So conversely, let's suppose the function has this property. So therefore there's some delta that, that works for every epsilon. But in order for this property to be true for every epsilon and every x and y within delta, it means that whenever you have x and y within delta, then their f of x and f of y values have to be within epsilon for every epsilon. And the only way that can happen is that if f of x equals f of y. So the property implies that whenever x and y are within delta, then f of x and f of y are equal. So that's implying locally constant on any delta interval, the function is constant. And so if I put all those intervals together, I get that the function is globally constant as well if it's a function on the real numbers. Okay, let's do another one. So this is saying f is constant. Here's another one. Um, for every epsilon bigger than zero, uh, for every x and y, um, there is a delta so that if x and y are within delta, then f of x and f of y are within us. Okay, so the, the question is what mathematical property does this expression express? So pause the video and give it some thought. For every epsilon, for every x and y, there's a delta, so that if x and y are within delta, then f of x and f of y are within epsilon. Okay, so I claim every function on the reals has this property. And the reason is that uh, um, if you give me any epsilon and any points x and y, then if x and y are equal, I'm gonna have the property for free. And if they're not equal, then I can pick a delta so that the antecedent here is false because delta will be too small. And therefore this implication will come out true in that case. So in any case, the statement comes out true so therefore the statement is just true for any function. It's not expressing any restricted property at all. Okay, so here's another one. Uh, for every epsilon bigger than zero, uh, for every delta bigger than zero, uh, for every x, there is a y. Um, so that uh, x is not equal to y and x and y are within delta and f of x and f of y are within epsilon. Okay, so I encourage you to think about the meaning of this statement. I won't say the answer, um, but uh, if you're watching this video on YouTube, then you can please post your proposal in the comments. Okay. Okay, so let's turn, let's now turn to um, the least double bound principle. So, so the least upper bound principle is one of the fundamental axioms of, uh, in, in real analysis, it's really expressing de the Dedekind completeness property of the real numbers. So what the least upper bound principle says is that if you have a set of real numbers, a non-empty set of real numbers, and it has an upper bound, then it has a least upper bound. So the picture here is, if this is the real line, and you have a set of real numbers like this A, 
and it has an upper bound, which means a number that's bigger than or equal to everything in A, then it has a least upper bound, okay? And that's for the supremum of A, the sup A, it's, an, it's the smallest number such that it's bigger than or equal to every member of A. That's called the least upper bound principle, the assertion that every non-empty bounded set has the least upper bound. And it's really impossible to, to, um, to overstate the importance of the least upper bound principle in real analysis. This is a principle that's used in basically almost every single argument uh, it's used in the proofs of all the fundamental theorems of real analysis. One is taking the supreme home or the least upper bound of sets all over the place. Um, and so, well, we could illustrate that. Suppose, well, we could prove, say, the intermediate value theorem. The intermediate value theorem is the assertion that if you have a continuous function, let's just draw a picture. Suppose that you're working on the interval from A to B and you have a continuous function. So here's F of A. And, and f of b is up here, bigger, you know, and it's continuous, then for any, for any value d in between f of a and f of b, then the theorem says that the, there must be a point c where, the, where f of c is equal to d. That's the intermediate value theorem. So every intermediate value is realized for a continuous function. So you can prove this by using the least upper bound principle. Namely, you let, you let A be the set of X values where F of X is less than D. And you let C be the supremum of that set, the least upper bound of that set. And then you argue that F of C, it can't be bigger than D because if F of C was bigger than D, then in a little neighborhood, it would have to be bigger because of that sum delta definition. And that would contradict that C was the least upper bound. And it can't be less than D because then in a little neighborhood of C, F would be below D and therefore uh, you could have made C a little bit bigger. And so it wouldn't be the least upper bound. So therefore F of C must be exactly D. Okay, so this is a proof of the intermediate value theorem using the least upper bound principle illustrating that. Um, <clears throat> Okay, but one can also use it to prove, say, the honey burrell theorem, or, or all, the, all the fundamental theorems of real analysis are featuring the, the least upper bound principle. What I'd like to do now is mention another principle, which is equivalent to the least upper bound principle, and from which you could make an alternative development of the theory of real analysis. And this, this principle is, is much less often mentioned, although it's very attractive in many respects. I learned about this principle from Pete Clark, who has a wonderful essay about developing the principles of real analysis using the principle of continuous induction. It has an old history, it goes back to the early 20th century. Um, so the principle of continuous induction is like this. What it says is, So this is the continuous induction. Of course, we mean induction in the sense of mathematical induction. So if A is a set of non-negative real numbers and one, zero is in A. So it's sort of like, an, it's, like a, it's like induction in the natural numbers. There's three zeros in the set. And if X is in A, then there is a delta so that the entire interval between x and x plus delta, maybe delta is very tiny, is contained in A. So if I have something in A, I can, I can make it a little bit bigger and have everything in between in A. And three, if all, uh, well, let's say it like this. If every number less than x is, is in A, then x itself is in A. So this is the half open interval. If everything below x is in A up to x, then x itself is in A. Okay, then, so if we have those three properties, then A is equal to all of the non-negative real numbers. Okay, so this principle has a very strong affinity with the induction principle of Dedekind, right? Dedekind says, look, if you have a set of natural numbers, and zero is in the set, and the set is closed under the successor operation, then all the natural numbers are in the set. 
That's exactly the induction principle. And this is very much like that because it's saying if you have a set of real numbers and zero is in, and whenever you have something that's in, it can be pushed a little bit bigger. That's like applying a successor, except that delta can be very tiny. Um, and this is another idea that if everything less than a given real number is in the set, then X itself is in the set. Okay, then everything is in the set. So this principle, it turns out, can be used to found uh, alternative arguments of all the fundamental principles of real analysis. You can prove the intermediate value theorem this way. You can prove um, the honey Borel theorem using this principle. And in fact, of course, it's equivalent to the least ever bound principle. So the two principles can prove each other, right? So, uh, but it's very attractive and it's easy to use actually, because you just have to argue that, well, if you want to prove something is true about all the numbers, then if it's true for X, then it's also true for numbers that are a little bit bigger than X. And if it's true for everything less than X, then it's true for X. So it's sort of induction like. Many mathematicians, when they first hear of this principle are very surprised because they think that induction, this was certainly my attitude when I first heard of the principle. You might think that induction is fundamentally about discrete orders, about well orders and this discrete process because the Dedekind induction axiom and say transfinite uh, uh, induction on the ordinals is about this sort of discreteness of the order. Whereas the real order is this continuous thing. And so that's why it's quite nice actually to have this principle of continuous induction uh, on the real numbers. So uh, Yun Ren Chao in 1919 talked about a very similar principle, it wasn't exactly this one. Um, so first he mentioned the argument from the thin end of the wedge, the idea the wedge is coming in. And then he mentions the argument from the camel's nose. So this is the argument with the camel is sticking his nose under the tent. And of course, uh, if the camel uh, has, is partly in the tent, he can always go another millimeter. And so the final conclusion, of course, is that the, the camel is gonna be inside the tent completely. Um, so then he gives his version of his principle, hypothesis one, let it be granted that the drinking of half a glass of beer be allowable. Half a glass of beer is allowable. Hypothesis two, if any quantity X of beer is allowable, then there's no reason why X plus Delta is not allowable, so long as Delta does not exceed an imperceptible amount capital Delta. So the conclusion of the argument is therefore any quantity of beer is allowable. So this is just the same principle. Um, if you can always put in a little bit more, even an imperceptibly tiny amount, then you can put in any amount. Okay. So, right. Let me now take a kind of philosophical turn and discuss the indispensability argument in mathematics. So this, uh, this argument is, uh, is basically asking what, what philosophical conclusion can we make from the fact that mathematical tools and vocabulary seem to lie at the very core of nearly every contemporary scientific theory. So it seems quite remarkable that at every physical scale from the microscopic to the cosmic, our best scientific theories are thoroughly mathematical and why should this be? We have the laws of Newtonian physics are expressed in universal differential equations that explain the interaction of forces and motion. They unify our understanding of, of uh, harmonic oscillations uh, of a mass on a spring to planetary motion and so on. <clears throat> uh, so uh, all of our best theories seem to be using mathematics uh, at the core, at their core. So Paul Dirac, uh, describe the physicists describe the situation like this. Uh, it seems to be one of the fundamental features of nature that fundamental physical laws are described in terms of a mathematical theory of great beauty and power, needing quite a high standard of mathematics for one to understand it. You might wonder why is nature constructed along these lines? One can only answer that our present knowledge seems to show that nature is so constructed. We simply have to accept it. One could perhaps describe the situation by saying that God is a mathematician of very high order. And he used very advanced mathematics in constructing the universe. Our feeble attempts at mathematics enable us to understand a bit of the universe. And as we proceed to develop higher and higher mathematics, we can hope to understand the universe better. Okay, so it seems that <clears throat> uh, 
uh, mathematics seems to be indispensable for physics and the other sciences. And on the basis of that, Quine and then later Putnam advanced what has come to be known as the indispensability argument for mathematical realism. So the argument uh, in a nutshell is saying that we ought to have an ontological commitment to the objects that are indispensably part of our best scientific theories. And because the uh, mathematical assertions, including the mathematical existence assertions are indispensably part of our best scientific theories, which are abundantly confirmed. Uh, this, we ought to have an ontological commitment to the existence of those mathematical objects. So this is an argument for mathematical realism, basically for Platonism, um, that it's confirmed by experiment. And Quine, of course, emphasizes the idea of conformational holism uh, by which a, a theories are confirmed only as a whole. So we have the, the scientific theory, which includes the mathematical component and the mathematical existence assertions that are part of that mathematical component. And when you confirm the scientific theory, then the whole theory is confirmed, including the mathematical existence assertion. Okay. So uh, this situation is similar to, uh, I mean, in science, for example, Maybe in the early days, we had the germ theory of disease that these uh, tiny microscopic particles were the source of disease. And this of course is abundantly confirmed, but at first there was no direct observation of those germs. But meanwhile, uh, uh, there were still grounds for having an ontological commitment to the existence of those germs and people would wash their hands and so on, even though the germs hadn't yet been seen. Um, <clears throat> or for example, uh, the theory of the atomic uh, the scientific theory regarding the atomic theory of matter, namely that uh, uh, all substance consists ultimately of tiny particles rather than being sort of continuously infinitely dis divisible. Uh, and the early evidence for that was, for example, in chemistry that chemical reactions generally involved low integer ratios of the substances in order to not have uh, materials left over in the reaction. Um, and this is evidence that they were somehow combining, you know, two and one or something. Uh, uh, which suggests very strongly the idea of very tiny particles that combined in discrete combinations um, to form molecules. Uh, so those atoms and molecules weren't seen even though that theory provided grounds for believing in them. Okay, later some of the evidence for the atomic theory of matter included Brownian motion by which very tiny uh, particles or say bacteria, which could be seen under the microscope, jiggle a little bit and the theory was that the, the reason they were moving on Brownian motion was because the, they were being bombarded by molecules and atoms that surrounded them and those forces were not exactly balanced and so they would be uh, jiggling around. Now Penelope Maddy has emphasized that in, in fact uh, scientists historically didn't always commit to the ontological existence of these unseen objects without having more direct evidence. For example, it wasn't really until Brownian motion uh, where you could see the thing moving. Uh, th this was extremely important for the acceptance of the atomic theory of matter. Um, also, another objection that's sometimes made um, is that scientists make uh, idealizing assumptions. For example, when you're analyzing uh, say the uh, wave motion in a body of water, it, it, say very deep water, then it's mathematically convenient to assume that the water is infinitely deep because otherwise you have to take account of sort of effects of the bottom of the ocean on how it affects the waves on the top. But those effects uh, are very small and it's much more mathematically uh, convenient to just assume that there is no bottom. Um, Okay, so if one has the idea that there are these idealizing assumptions or like consider a cow, assume it's spherical. This is the old joke, the spherical cow. Um, so in science, we make these kind of idealizing assumptions in order to enable the calculations because otherwise uh, it's too difficult to do some of the calculations. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're ontologically committed to an infinitely deep ocean or to spherical cows. Um, just because we make a prediction on the basis of those assumptions and then that prediction is confirmed. Um, so there's another aspect to this uh, that I want to mention, and that is uh, uh, concerning the, uh, the nature of physical existence versus abstract existence. And part of the indispensability argument, I, I think, is based on the presumption that uh, we have a solid account of what it means for uh, things to exist physically, you know, desks and tables and chairs and rocks and so on. So we know completely what it means. Uh, 
to understand uh, <clears throat> uh, this kind of physical existence, whereas the abstract existence is sort of suspect. We don't know whether the number 17 exists or 57 or these other abstract objects. This is what's uh, the, the problem that's trying to be solved with the indispensability argument. But my way of thinking about it <clears throat> is that maybe we have that that situation exactly backwards, because I think actually that we don't have a very good account of what it means to say that something exists physically. We have a lot of experience with things that exist physically. I can knock on this desk and I know that this desk exists physically, but what does it mean to say that something exists physically? I think this is a profound mystery and that there isn't really any convincing thing that we can say about what it means to say that something exists in the physical universe. Why isn't the nature of, of existence uh, in the universe somehow totally different than it is with physical existence? Why isn't there some other totally different kind? And I think to, to give an account of that is extremely difficult and is nothing less than a profound mystery. Whereas we can seem to give an account, at least in simple cases of abstract existence, for example, to say, what does it mean to say that the empty set exists or that the set containing the empty set exists? So in some sense, we, we seem to have a more thorough account of the nature of this kind of simple abstract existence than we do uh, of what it means to say that, say, a desk exists physically. We can knock on it. But that's not really an argument or an explanation of what it means to exist physically. Okay, so now let's go on though uh, to Hartree Field's uh, arguments. So he attacks the indispensability argument at its heart uh, by arguing that the truth of mathematics is not actually indispensable for science. Um, so he's going to defend a nominalist approach to mathematics, arguing that we don't actually require the actual existence of the abstract objects in order to undertake successful scientific analysis. So actually, there's two parts of his argument that I want to mention. So the first part is that is pointing out that there's a kind of logical error in the indispensability argument. Namely, even if mathematical theories are indispensable, that's not a reason to suppose that they're actually true. It would be sufficient, for example, if the mathematical claims formed merely a conservative extension of the scientific theory. Okay, so what does it mean conservative extension? So when you have a theory and you have an extension of that theory, then the extension of the theory is conservative for a class of assertions if any such assertion provable in the, in the stronger theory is already provable in the smaller theory. <clears throat> so, so Field is talking about the situation where when you have the nominalized physics, I mean, you have the, the physical claims and then you have the mathematical, the, the extension of the theory uh, to the mathematical existence claims, then uh, it would be enough if, the, if that was a conservative extension for assertions about the physical universe. So, so in other words, we don't really need that the mathematical existence claims are true. We only need that it's a conservative extension of the nominalized form. Okay, so this is what he does. So um, uh, he's, he's trying to um, <clears throat> produce uh, a, a, an account and he, and he does so in his book. So of the New Newtonian theory of gravity, he wants to produce a version of the scientific theory which doesn't make mathematical existence assumptions. So. <clears throat> so he does that by expressing the content of the theory entirely in terms of physical objects. So one way of understanding how this might work is that instead of talking about numbers and functions on numbers and so on, then we talk about, say, positions of particles and, and uh, you know, wh whether they're far apart or close together, then the, the location and distance of the particles is a physical object, a physical abstract object. Um, that is a kind of stand-in for the number. And so he wants to re-express all of the scientific theories in terms of those physical concepts only, and uh, it quite impressively seems to do so. I want to mention another instance of that pattern that arises entirely of mathematics. So, so consider in the early days of the complex numbers. So we have the real numbers and we're looking at equations and trying to solve these equations in the real numbers. And the, this newfangled, mysterious, terrifying complex number system uh, is introduced. And so at first the mathematicians were sort of skeptical of, of uh, what was going on with those complex numbers, but they could still calculate with them. And so, 
So they were trying to find solutions of their uh, polynomials and they would proceed through the land of nonsense, through the complex numbers and arrive at a real number solution, which then they could check independently. And so it must have seemed quite mysterious to them uh, to, to be concerned about the real numbers and then perform this calculation with things that maybe they regarded as completely imaginary or nonsensical and then arrive at an answer that they could check independently without needing that. Um, so that's a kind of situation of a conservative extension. Um, you, don't need, if, you don't need the complex numbers to exist actually if you're only concerned with the real number conclusions. Okay, so <clears throat> now one way of understanding what's going on with this um, uh, Fields nominalization program is, uh, is the philosophy of fictionalism. So fictionalism in the philosophy of mathematics is the, <clears throat> the idea that mathematical existence assertions are not literally true, but rather are a kind of convenient fiction uh, useful for a purpose. <clears throat> so according to fictionalism, statements in mathematics are similar in status to statements about fictional events. So if you have an arithmetic assertion P, then uh, we can interpret this statement as according to the theory of arithmetic P. We don't assert P, we assert the statement according to the theory of arithmetic P, according to that story P. So it's just like one might say, according to the story by Beatrix Potter, Jeremy Fisher enjoys punting, boating on the river. Uh, okay, it's, it's interesting to notice that this fictionalist idea might seem to lead you toward non-classical logic in mathematics. So for example, suppose that in the story of Beatrix Potter, the cost of Jeremy Fisher's punt, his boat, suppose that it, the cost isn't discussed. It just, the story has nothing to say about whether he paid two shillings or more or not. Um, well, then you might, you might be, uh, you, you might want to say, um, well, I think it would be wrong to say, according to the story by Beatrix Potter, Jeremy Fisher paid more than two shillings for his punt, because if the story doesn't have anything to say about it, then that, that statement would be false. But it would also be wrong to say, according to the story by Beatrix Potter, Jeremy Fisher didn't pay more than two shillings for his punt. And so the question is, is this a violation of the law of excluded middle? Because we haven't asserted P and we haven't asserted not P. Um, and as I see it, no, this is not what it means to assert, uh, to deny the law of excluded middle. This is not going to actually lead us to non-classical logic. It, the situation is just the same whenever you have an incomplete theory. If you're, if you're arguing in, entirely in classical logic with an incomplete theory T, then the theory isn't gonna prove a statement P. There's gonna be a statement P so that it doesn't prove P and it doesn't prove not P, say the continuum hypothesis in CFC. So just because the continuum hypothesis is not provable and not refutable doesn't mean we've given up classical logic when we're dealing with this theory. And the reason is that the, the theory still proves P or not P, it proves that disjunction. And uh, on fictionalism, the story of Jeremy Fisher can be taken as presenting a kind of uh, ordinary world in which either it is or is not true that he paid more than two shillings, even though the story doesn't tell us which one, the story isn't presented as, as, uh, as a situation in which it would be neither, that neither of those would, would be the case. Okay. In a robust sense, fictionalism, I view fictionalism as a, a retreat from the object theory into the meta theory. So let, let's make the theory meta theory distinction. So uh, the object theory is the theory that's describing the mathematical content that the subject matter is about. Okay, so when you're doing, if, if I'm considering the say ZFC set theory, then that's the object theory. When I'm using the object theory, I'm arguing inside ZFC, I'm arguing about the nature of sets. Maybe I, I'm able to prove that there are infinite sets and, and uncountable sets of vast cardinality and so on. In the meta theory, you're analyzing the nature of the theory and the sort of syntactic properties of the theory and whether something is provable in the theory or not provable or whether the theory is consistent and so on. These are sort of meta theoretic claims about uh, the theory. In the meta theory, maybe we don't have any infinite sets and we're not asserting uncountable sets uh, at all. We're, so in the meta theory, we would say Z, the theory ZFC proves that there are uncountable sets, but in the meta theory, we're not making the assertion that there are uncountable sets. So it seems like the move from say P to according to the story of arithmetic P is 
very similar or almost exactly the same as the move from a, moving from the theory to the meta theory. Um, so we say, according to the theory P, this is a meta theoretic claim. Okay. Now let me sort of switch gears and talk a little bit about the rise of abstraction and the function concepts. I guess I'm going to go a little over an hour. <clears throat> so what is a function? I mean, maybe when we're first exposed to functions in mathematics, then almost always it's because we have some formula that's telling us the, the value. Maybe we have the function x squared, or we you know, have square root of something, or the sine of x, uh, or e to the x, and so on. OK, but now already, even those functions are actually increasing in their complexity of the definition, because the latter two are transcendental functions and the earlier ones. Um, are expressible in terms of the algebraic operations only, I mean, addition and multiplication. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so, so the history of mathematics is a history of, of increasing abstraction in the function concept. And eventually um, people were intro introducing infinite series or Fourier series and so on. And finally, um, mathematicians uh, arrived at a completely general set theoretic conception of, of function where a function is any relation uh, having the functional property, which means that to each input, it, it produces uh, at most one output. Um, uh, so whether or not that relation is definable by an equation or by a rule of any kind. So I wanna show you some examples uh, that maybe stretch the, the function concept. So let me just share my screen here and I'll show you some of these examples. Okay, let's see, I guess, um, I guess this is the one. Okay, so I think I'm sharing my screen now. And so here's a picture of what's called the devil's staircase. This is a function that Cantor introduced. So it's defined on the unit interval in the real numbers. And Cantor starts by considering the middle third of that interval. And on that middle third, uh, the function has the value one half here. And then in, on each side, he takes the middle third of that piece here and here, and he interpolates the value. So one quarter here and three quarters over here and so on. We keep going middle third on each of those remaining intervals and interpolate the value in between. And this defines then a function on the unit interval if we take the, the continuous limit. So it's a continuous function you can prove and it has a remarkable property. Namely, uh, it's, it's flat on all of these intervals. And the, the total length of those intervals is one. The Lebesgue measure of the Cantor set, which is the places where those intervals are, uh, is, is full measure. It has measure one. And so this is how the devil ascends from zero to one in a continuous manner while almost always being completely motionless. The function as a zero derivative almost everywhere and it's continuous and yet it's not a constant function. So let's now um, uh, consider another function, the space filling curve. So what is a curve? A curve is a function from the unit interval into the plane say. So we can think of this as describing the position of a rocket as it flies around in the plane. So at t equals zero, the rocket is here, and then it flies around as the time increases, and then at t equal one, it's at this endpoint. And similarly, this is a different curve. So the curve isn't just the set of points that are traced out, it's, it's the way that they're traced out, you know, because it's the whole function from the interval, from the time interval into the plane. So here's another one. Now these particular curves have a kind of one dimensional character. When you look at them locally, they have this one dimensional nature. But it was discovered by Piano that there are these completely bizarre space filling curves. And this one is not Piano's curve, but was another uh, one introduced by Hilbert, which is slightly um, easier. Uh, so we, none of these is the Hilbert curve, but these are approximations to the Hilbert curve. So we start out with a very simple sort of uh, um, partial square here. So at t equals zero, it's at this end and then it travels up and over and then down here at t equal one. And now the next approximation introduces some wiggles to that curve. 
Um, so maybe at t equal half, it's right in this middle point here. And now we have more wiggles at the next level of approximation and then even more wiggles and more and more and more and so on. And what Hilbert does is he takes the limit. So at t equals zero, it's at this left, lower left point. And at t equal one, it's here. And at t equal half, it's on the little bridge that crosses. So each of these have a little bridge crossing. That's the, the t equal one half point is right when it's going over that little bridge um, and, and so on. And so, the remarkable property about this curve in the limit is that it is onto every point in the unit square is visited by that curve at some point. And so therefore, well, the reason this is shocking is that it's a way of taking a one dimensional time interval and laying it out onto the unit square in a way that fills up the unit square entirely, this two dimensional thing. And so it means that, um, yeah. In a sense, continuity is not dimension preserving. And that's what's so shocking about this. OK, so let me stop this chair. And then I'll go on. There's more examples in my book, if you look, the Conway base 13 function. So what I want to do now is um, talk about uh, a remarkable development that happened in the 1950s regarding calculus and infinitesimals. Um, so, but before I mention that, I just want to say that you shouldn't misunderstand the nature of infinitesimals in the early days of calculus. They were using infinitesimals, but you shouldn't imagine that uh, that it was all a a, a, a kind of um, cartoonish nonsense approach. The, the early mathematicians in calculus, to the contrary, had extremely deep insights into uh, fundamental truths uh, of, of mathematics, um, even though they didn't have proper foundations. And so maybe that gives a philosopher pause. You know, is it, is it necessary to have uh, completely robust, legitimate foundations in order to gain mathematical insights of enduring value? And the answer is apparently not, because uh, in calculus, it proceeded for uh, more than a century without having proper foundations, and yet they still made extremely important advances and uh, had important insights. Even today, infinitesimals are routinely used in engineering and in calculus, um, uh, in a kind of informal manner. So, for example, um, <clears throat> maybe you have a function f here, say, on an interval um, from a to b, and you want to revolve it around the x-axis. So you revolve this, uh, this function. Let's see, I want to draw this like this. So I imagine making this kind of tube shaped thing by revolving the function around the x axis to make this, uh, I could put my arm through this, uh, through this kind of tubular thing. And I want to compute the volume. And how do I compute the volume? Well, I imagine any point x and I slice, I slice it with a knife at x. So that gives me this kind of, uh, this kind of disc, let's draw it in red here. So I've got this disc here, <clears throat> um, uh, and uh, and I can think of the 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 whole tube is just those discs piled on top of each other, and if the thickness of that disc is an infinitesimal dx, then uh, the total volume would just be the integral from a to b, right, of the uh, of the infinitesimal volume of each disc, and what is that dv? Well, it's the integral from a to b. dv is just the the radius, the, the volume of one disk is of course the area of the disk times the thickness. And what is the area? Well, it's pi r squared. And so it's pi times f of x squared dx. That's the area times the thickness of each disk. Okay, and so this formula tells me how to compute the total volume in terms of the, um, the integral of these infinitesimal disks. Okay, this is extremely standard kind of reasoning in calculus. And the point is that uh, we really do think in terms of those infinitesimal amounts. Now one can make it uh, uh, legitimate using differential forms and so on as a whole uh, rigorous mathematical theory about that. Um, but in practice, we just use the infinitesimals. So now the remarkable development in the 1950s um, uh, 
really astounding due to Abraham Robinson was the rise of non-standard analysis. So, so this theory was using tools of mathematical logic um, to introduce what's come to be known as the, the hyperreal numbers. So let me draw a picture of the hyperreal numbers. So I'm going to draw the real line in blue. So this is the real numbers. And I mean all of it. So I've compressed the scale towards the end. So I don't mean that the blue line should continue going up. This is the entire real number line. So we have zero and one and two is a little bit closer in order to fit them all in three and so on. Okay, so, so those are the real numbers and the negatives on this side. And now Robinson's hyper real numbers are form an extension of the real numbers. So there's going to be numbers above all the real numbers. So there's going to be these infinite hyper real numbers n that are bigger than any real number. And of course, their negations are going to be there. This is r star, the hyper real numbers r star. Now, of course, if I have a number n like that, then one over n is going to be smaller than every positive real number, but it won't be zero. So if I imagine sort of looking at zero under a microscope, then I've got the real number zero here in blue, but then surrounding it uh, are all of these um, hyper real numbers. So maybe one over n uh, is infinitely close to zero, but it's not zero. So it's infinitely close in the sense that it's closer to zero than any other real number is. So now I drew this blue line as a sort of solid line, but actually every, around every uh, number here, I can zoom in, you know? So maybe I have uh, a number um, Z here. And if I uh, have this line, um, maybe Z is showing up here, then uh, I claim that there's gonna be a, a real number called the standard part of Z here, standard. So I should really put little red dots everywhere because of course I could take any real number like two plus one over n that's going to be infinitely close to uh, uh, to two and so on. there'll be a picture just like this around every real number. So there's lots of hyper real numbers mixed in and every real number is in a little neighborhood. It's infinitesimal neighborhood um, and okay. So these are the hyper reals. This is the, what the picture looks like. It's maybe difficult to imagine how there could be something bigger than every real number. But R star, of course, is not necessarily Archimedean. I mean, it's definitely not Archimedean. So uh, there, it's a mathematical structure that simply has such objects, these infinitely large objects that go beyond the um, real numbers. Okay, and now the amazing thing though about the hyperreal numbers is what's called the transfer principle. So when Newton and Leibniz were using infinitesimals, then we had said, well, it, it, an infinitesimal can't just be a really tiny real number because then it would be wrong to ignore it and cast it out in those calculations. It has to be some other totally different kind of mathematical object. And then we said, right, that we would need a more thorough account of what is the nature of those infinitesimals and how do they interact. And that's exactly what Robinson provides. He proved that any statement in the, uh, about the real numbers is also true in the hyperreal numbers. So in the formal language that he sets up, which can be quite robust, then every statement that's true in the structure of the real numbers with addition, multiplication, exponentiation, whatever kind of functions and relations you want there of any order, then any statement true there is also true in the hyperreal numbers. And therefore, uh, on the basis of this transfer principle, one can develop calculus using infinitesimals in an entirely rigorous and robust manner. So the transfer principle can be stated as, in, in terms of mathematical logic, that the real numbers form an elementary substructure of the hyperreal numbers. Okay, so it's an elementary substructure, and you can put any uh, any language you want on the reals, and then there's going to be a corresponding hyperreals for which it's an elementary substructure. Okay, so let's say a little bit about how calculus works in non-standard analysis. So um, suppose we want to compute the derivative of a function f. You know, now uh, 
then what we do is we just fix an infinitesimal. Let's call this let's call this one delta, and we fix a, a an infinitesimal in the hyperreal numbers, and we compute the slope of the secant line, you know, which is this quotient, you know, and then we just take the standard part, yeah, and the standard part of a bounded hyperreal number is the unique real number which is infinitely close, which is infinitesimally close to it. So whatever this secant slope is, it's going to be some number z, and so it will have a standard part which will be a standard real number. And so <clears throat> in the case of the x squared function, then we were taking the standard part of 2x plus delta, but delta was infinitesimal, and so we're getting 2x. I mean, in the case when f of x is the x squared function, then taking the standard part is exactly how the ghosts uh, depart. Yeah? So we're not just throwing delta away, it's disappearing in this standard part operator. Okay. So, so one can develop essentially all of calculus in this non-standard analysis method. And I'd like to explain a few different perspectives about non-standard analysis. So you know, how are we to understand the nature of the hyperreal numbers and the use of them in non-standard analysis? So on one point of view, and maybe this was Robinson's point of view, um, we can understand uh, non-standard analysis just model theoretically. We have the real numbers, and then we have this hyperreal number system, which is an extension, and we have this transfer principle. And so we basically have these two different structures, and we can go back and forth by paying attention to whether what we have is a hyperreal number or, or a standard real number, um, and we can reason uh, this way. So we can build the hyperreal numbers using what's called, say, the ultra power construction of Walsh, and, uh, and we can analyze that structure mathematically and uh, uh, figure out its mathematical properties. Okay. So there's another way to do nonsense analysis, and this is with an axiomatic approach. We can write down the axioms that are describing the situation. So we're going to have the standard reals and then the non-standard reals, and we don't build a particular structure. We just write down the truths that we want, and uh, we can express the transfer principle as a scheme that's expressing this elementarity condition. So, so we say whenever p of x is true, then um, <clears throat> um, then uh, uh, p of x star. Is, whenever p of x is true in the reals, then p of x star is true in the hyperreals, where x star is the sort of non-standard analog, the interpretation of that x in the hyperreals. So we can consider that as a scheme. Um, and we might want to introduce a saturation principles for the hyperreals, and then we can just argue from these axioms. And this works completely fine. And there's various theories, some of them weaker, some of them are more expressive. And that brings me to a certain issue with the hyperreal numbers, namely, uh, one quite commonly sees and hears references to the hyperreal numbers, but actually, this is not quite right. Well, if you go to Math Overflow, you can Google that phrase the hyperreals, and you'll find hundreds of instances of it. Um, but the problem is that there isn't just one structure of the hyperreals. We do not have a categorical theory for the hyperreal numbers. There isn't just one structure, and they're not all isomorphic. And so from a point of view of structuralism, it's maybe problematic because when we're talking about the hyperreal numbers, then we don't know what we mean because there's lots of different structures that maybe could be considered to be the hyperreal numbers, but they're not isomorphic to each other. Um, and so, uh, so, so ultimately it seems incorrect and, and not meaningful to refer to the hyperreal numbers. And so the situation uh, regarding the hyperreal numbers in non-standard analysis is really much less satisfactory from a structuralist point of view. Um, and I believe that this is maybe part of the explanation uh, about why nonsense analysis hasn't caught on fully in mathematics. It's, it's nonsense analysis is fully powerful and fully capable of doing anything that you can do, say, with epsilon delta conceptions in ordinary analysis. Um, and uh, in fact, one can translate. So one shouldn't think that somehow one method is fundamentally more powerful than the other. You can translate between these methods quite easily. 
Um, it has to do with you know the conception of the way that we're thinking about using the methods, and so uh, it's also maybe partly a matter of mathematical upbringing. You know, you learned one method when you were a student, so that's the one that you stick with. And nonsense analysis just you know wasn't often used. Um, but okay, I wonder if this lack of categoricity is an obstacle to it being adopted more fully, because precisely because we we can't. Uh, have a singular reference for the hyperreal numbers. There isn't just one structure, and this prevents a straightforward treatment of non-centered analysis uh, on those structuralist grounds. Okay, so so far we've had these two different perspectives. There was the model theoretic perspective where we build the hyperreal numbers using an ultra power, and of course it depends on the ultra filter, right? They might not all be isomorphic. Um, the second method was this axiomatic method. And the third method is much more radical. Uh, it's what I call the radical non standardist perspective, um, where one basically swaps perspectives and you think about the hyper real numbers as the real thing. And then the standard real numbers is a sort of sub, uh, sub collection of the actual real numbers. And so when you have this radical point of view, then when you say, you know, suppose I have a real number, um, uh, then it's not necessarily a standard real number. You can take it standard part if it's bounded, or maybe you have an infinite integer or something inside the, uh, the, the real number. So from this radical point of view, it makes sense to talk about infinite integers. Of course, you can't have an infinite standard integer, um, but on this perspective, it's a way of speaking. Uh, the integers means the non-standard one. Yeah, So you're swapping the, no the non-standard one for the real thing. And then of course, um, uh, so my colleague, uh, Karl Horbachek in New York, uh, for example, has this kind of perspective in his theories and so on. And he has the standardness operator and then many, many levels. So there's levels of standardness, which is a way of saying, well, it's sort of like levels of, in, uh, of infinitesimality. You know, so you have an infinitesimal, but then you have something that's infinitesimal with respect to that and so on as many times as you want, transfinitely and so on. Um, okay, all of those methods you can translate between them, not only between the different conceptions of nonsense analysis, but also between any of the nonsense analysis methods and the um, uh, epsilon delta way of doing real analysis. Um, okay, so I guess that's uh, that's all I wanted to say for today. So I'm so glad uh, um, to see so many people at these lectures, and I'll see you next week. We'll be talking about infinity. Um, and different kinds of infinity. So see you then. Bye.